Welcome to this week's episode of The Neuro Show. In today's episode... Is the planning before you start a training block more exciting than actually doing it? Everyone was up in arms about our comments from last week. Should we walk them back or double down? Global cycle tourism is booming. Where would we go on a cycling tour trip? Dutch kit brand, BBU Sports, and Chris travels to the US. What races should he do? All right, let's get into it. What's the phrase? Something like kicking over a hornet's nest or... <laughs> What's the, I can't remember what the something line like is, that. something if someone's kicked something over. Yeah, I don't know. So obviously last week we potentially got out in front of uh, the controversy. I don't know, but we just called it as we saw it. Mm-hmm. Is there anything you want to add? Do you want to walk anything forward? Do you walk, want to walk <laughs> anything back? Like where, where, where are you at here? I feel It's still going. That's mm. the thing. It, it is still... Not that our video in particular, but just the chat around it. It's still there's still articles coming up. I'm annoyed that we have to talk about it again, really, because as I said in the two episodes ago, doping chat is not something that occupies much of our space. In the fifty ep- well, nearly fifty episodes we've done of this show, we've probably spent twenty minutes discussing doping in the hours and hours and hours. It doesn't it doesn't live rent free in my head. Um, but I guess it's a hot topic now, so we'll, we just got stuff to cover on it. And the other thing as well, I didn't like the way that episode came across because it, it sounded like we were just two guys who accuse everyone of doping and, and yada, yada, yada. Like for people that have watched the show before, they would probably know, I, I think most of the writers are clean. Call me a naive, whatever it is. I don't think every performance is suspicious or that there's widespread doping in the peloton. The only reason we discussed that performance in particular was because it was a, an outlier as, as to what we've usually seen and that's why we questioned it so just yeah the people that the problem is the people that watched last week's episode Who are these and, and want to hear this they're not going to be watching this episode so we're kind of preaching to the choir here anyway but in terms of the performance itself is there anything that has come up in the last few days that warrants just in terms of the performance, I'm not, not not necessarily talking about the reaction to it, just the performance. Oh, they revised Lantern Rouge Media, the guy that does the watts per kilo calculations on there, they revised their estimations. He had a wrong time check. So his estimation was 7.6 watts per kilo, conservatively 7.4. He's revised that now for between 7.28 to 7.4 at the upper level. I don't know. Is that even is that accurate anyway? I, I mean, we don't know. But it's so the the <laughs> stratospheric seven point six watts per kilo, which is was we were just to. just a joke, mm. is now. I mean, seven point four is still in, whether that's accurate or not is still insane if it is, and that's an amazing performance. But it's not that just outright <laughs> ridiculousness that it was. So clarifying that. And the thing, and now we've got things coming up around these watts per kilo calculations. So Inigo Sambalan releases a tweet saying, these watts per kilo calculations on Twitter are a joke. They're 30, 40 watts over. In some cases, they can't be trusted. And then Richard Pluger, the manager from Yombo Visma in one of the articles said, we release our power data to some journalists if they request it, not publicly to everyone. But if you want to know the watts per kilo, if you look on Twitter, some of the watts per kilo estimations there are quite accurate. So on one hand, they're not accurate at all. And on the other hand, he says they're quite accurate. And the problem is they're not, they're not saying who's, what's, <laughs> who's accurate, who's not. So we don't know. But isn't, isn't this the problem though? Because ultimately what we were asking for last week was just clarity on this. Mm-hmm. You know? And it was, I suppose, a pretty broad suggestion. I mm-hmm. think you phrased it something like, don't we deserve an answer or something like that? Would I feel like I deserve an answer? So, oh, it's an analysis, an at analysis. least not an answer. You're never going to get yeah. an answer. Doesn't ex- mm. an answer is impossible? Mm. But an, an an objective analysis that would make sense would be yeah. That's what I mean. With and power what, data. Okay. With so what data. would that what would that look like? Well, I I think the best step forward would be just make all the power data public from every rider. As I said in the episode before, we have the biological passport. We're tracking these riders' freaking blood <laughs> day by day. We can see the power data. If you want to, in to, to, uh, people don't not really. I don't know why people don't get this, but we're tracking their blood. We're testing them for for drugs. 
What's the one of the best measures of whether a rider's doping or not? Their, their actual performance, the physiological output. And so having the power data would be a step forward. It's not perfect. We know we talk every second episode how the power meters aren't accurate and yada, yada, yada. And so it's not a foolproof, but it'd be a good step forward if the power data was just accurate. It would also help the broadcast because they could show it live. Well, and, and, and then these things, then we could just not be running off speculation mm. from back calculated things on Twitter. And we'd have at least a starting point for, for speculation. Could it be, could it be something where there was an independent body where the power data did go that sim- similar to a WADA, which essentially analyzed performances and went, okay, here's a, here's an outlier performance, Jesse Coyle. Hang on. Why is he suddenly doing 7.4 Watts per kilo for 20 minutes? Let's, let's delve into this and look into it. Like it, uh, maybe it doesn't need to be public information. Maybe it just needs to be information that's available to someone that, we trust. Yes, to a body like WADA. Like, I'm not expecting Jumbo Visma to tell everyone Jonas Vingegaard's mm. hemoglobin, but it's still tracked and it's still in a database that's tracked by WADA. So, again, power, I, 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 I think having that power data tracked would be a, a good step forward in the, the anti doping. It doesn't mean, oh, you've done 7.4 watts per kilo, you've doped, but it would be a flag. And then that would then put more pressure in terms of the anti-doping efforts on the people that are doing the most insane watts per kilo. I think that's fair. And then two idiots on a video podcast <laughs> wouldn't be waking up the next day after a show and going, oh, that looks like a bit of an outlier. So <laughs> I want to... Can I just... So the yeah. other thing as well, in terms of this um, analysis, because we've seen some... Let's get... <laughs> let's have a laugh here because the analysis that's come out, because some of the journalists are pushing, especially the French ones, and some of the things that are coming up are just... Uh, it's it's hilarious. So we've got things like um, the Richard Pluger coming out and saying, well, um, you know, you question our performances, but we have a, a, a Cervelo frame that's 100 grams lighter because it's custom painted and, and we saw FDJ riders drinking beer in the hotel. And that's so not helpful because it doesn't – that's <laughs> – just accusing another team of drinking beers doesn't explain your performance. So these, when they, these journalists ask these questions and we just get these silly answers, uh, it doesn't make sense. And then the other one that came out that I had a laugh at was, so apparently um, there was a, a uh, cycling, not cycling tips in here, what are they called? Escape Collective did an article sort of trying to explain how they went so fast in the TT. Basically just just getting on their knees for Jumbo Visma and saying how amazing they are and how well prepared they are and to go through every marginal gain. And yet Jumbo Visma come out, the big, the big marginal gains, every possible speed, and yet they say, oh, no, Jonas won't even take paracetamol. He, he doesn't even take ketones. He wouldn't, he wouldn't touch that. I'm like, you're expecting me to believe the biggest marginal gains team doing all these things to go fast has a rider that won't take stuff that's legal that's proven to make you ride faster. Give me a break. Come on. Like, it's just things like that that I just – these articles come out in the last week. This is where it gets funny for me, Jesse. All right. And we, we debated this during the week. Do we talk about this? Do we not want to talk about this? And for me, it was, it was the reaction and the stuff that came after it, which is the reason I wanted to talk about this mm. because I don't know. Maybe this is because I lived through the Lance – Thing. Like mm. I, I was the biggest Lance fanboy there was, and to have that sort of ripped out beneath me was a pretty gutting experience. I, I remember it quite well, and I'm I'm sure there's a lot of people watching who are amazed they're still involved in the sport given given what just happened. And the reason I bring that up is, like, I saw these comments underneath the video last week saying <laughs> stuff like. Oh, uh, you can't just go accusing. He's never tested positive for anything. You can't do this. You can't just throw accusations. He's never tested positive. Uh, I was shocked to read the quote of he's never tested positive <laughs> and we are still using that as a defense for anything in this sport. That's mm. completely unacceptable. And like you said in the beginning, this is coming from two people who don't want to talk about this. It's not... It's not in our interest. We're not particularly into it in the first place. So that reaction to me surprised me that all of a sudden th- 
things have got defensive. Well, the other funny thing on that point is since when is it controversial to, to suspect the guy winning the Tour de France might be doping? I mean, you walk out in the street right now and pull someone over and say, oh, do you reckon the guy winning the Tour de France is on drugs? Everyone's going to say yes. It's not, exa- it's not exactly a hot take to think, to think the guy might be doping. So uh, to, think that, to think that Jonas Vingegaard is hurt that people think he might be doping, he won the Tour de France last year. It, mm. it, no news to him. No surprise to him. Do you think he's losing sleep at night because people think he's doping? Hell no. He's won the Tour de France. This is part and parcel of it. So, uh, yeah, d- 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 we don't need to feel sorry for the riders that they get accused of doping. If he's not doping, he'll never test positive. There'll never be a scandal that comes out around him. His legacy in the sport will live on forever, and he won't even care because he knows he's clean and he has nothing on his mind. He doesn't care that all the French media and two blokes on YouTube think you might be questioning, uh, questioning, questioning. I, uh, questioning whether that performance was natural. That He doesn't care. If you're natural, you don't care. People think I'm doping. Mm. I get accused of doping to win an A-grade career. Do you think I am, like, offended or cry? No, it's just I know I'm clean. It doesn't matter. So these people sort of in the comments. Look, it's a Tour de France is on. All his fans and the people would just get – they can't ha- – like – I think Jonas Vingegaard's fans get more offended that he mm. gets accused of doping than Jonas Vingegaard would, because mm. if he knows he, he knows he's clean, he probably doesn't care. Yeah, and, I mean, and actually, the team would probably get more offended because they're the ones that have to defend the sort of stuff. I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't feel like that was the reaction of just the the Danish. Of course, that's the case. Like, if after Cadell had won the tour. Like these two idiots get on the podcast and say, Cadell's doping, you know, Australia, <laughs> you're all cheating, blah, blah, blah. Of course, we all would have been up in arms yeah. about it and sort of gone. So, yeah, I, I, I completely understand that. But there was there was certainly enough of a response from people who I don't think are in that bubble mm, okay. who are have suddenly – and I remember when we, when we were talking about this, I thought we – I thought our take was quite a warm tea take <laughs> on it. Like I didn't think we would be particularly controversial from from saying this. So it really surprised me to see so many people kind of, I suppose, leaping to the defence of him and that team. And I don't know why. I don't know why that is the case because I certainly feel like it wasn't that long ago that to question this stuff, like you said, wasn't, wasn't a hot take in any way, shape, or form. Mm. And that's a bit of a worry for me. Like that's ultimately the only point I want to make yeah. is that is a worry for me. If we get into a place where anyone becomes too big to fail, mm. then I've fucking been there, all right? And that is a bad place. I I can't believe the sport of cycling survived the Lance controversy. I said that to you during the week. Like the absolute bombshell that that was. You know, and that was because this man became too big for the sport mm. and we couldn't question him. Mm. So I don't know. Um, Can I confuse this even further? Yeah, right, Because my opinion is, right, this is going to sound really confusing. I actually think Vingegaard's clean. I do too. I, I actually think most of the riders are clean. I, I find it hard to believe they're doping. I, maybe I'm probably just naive. I, I, I genuinely think that. And people are going to think, you're just backtracking, you're full of shit. I genuinely think that. I just thought that performance, I don't see how that performance, <laughs> I don't see how that performance was possible naturally, but I also think they're clean. That uh, that's probably sounds quite strange, but that's honestly what I think about it. And so that's and and that's where the questions lie. And it's contradicting in my head. On one hand, I think most of these, not, I shouldn't even say most of, on one hand, I think these riders are clean. And on the other hand, I see these performances and I think they're doped performances. You know, I don't have an answer, but that's well, genuinely my opinion. But you said that two weeks ago. It. You were yeah. like, uh, uh, these these performances are incredible. Like, here we are trying to debate over it. But imagine if they all are just all taking the piss. Yeah. Like, it was almost, <laughs> yeah. it's like this side thought for yeah. us at this point. Yeah, yeah, like, I don't know. So the, the other thing, the other funny one was, oh, we, that they come, just don't say anything. I'd rather they don't say anything. They come out of the stuff of, Oh, we can't be doping. We got Netflix cameras with us. It's like <laughs> that's not a, that, that doesn't that's not Do moving know, the needle in any way. Just shut up. Just Do you know don't how many anything. documentaries were done about Lance Armstrong before <laughs> it all happened? Like how many uh, books were written? You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's um, no, I know what you mean. And and just like the the laughable 
nature of of the, the head of Yumbo coming out and saying, oh, it's because we're not on the piss every night that, you know, that's why the performances have increased. I mean, that just doubles down on the dumb as far as I'm concerned. I, I kind of get that's not what he was saying because it's, it's, it's not what he was – it's not what he intended to say, but it's just totally tone deaf – Wrong thing to say. And that next stage, I've never been a Tebow T- Pino fan, but that next stage where he got in the break, I was like, come on, Tebow. Like, <laughs> Can I shift this conversation yeah, then? Let's go. Because I don't get the Tebow Pino froth. I don't get it. I'm, I'm. What do you mean? You were big upping him Tebow? a month ago, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, it was a month ago. I've moved oh, on. You flipped on. No, okay. I've, you flipped on it. Oh, yeah. I, I, okay. So. You're you're on board. You were you're so the big. I always hated the drama around it. But he won me over. Well, Richard Pluger flipped me on them, and then I was suddenly that was just this underdog that was getting shit shit on by this arrogant, well-funded team that was doing well. Oh, I see. <laughs> I'm yeah. pretty sure it wasn't even the riders that were drinking. I think they came out and said, "No, it was team staff." Yeah, it was team staff. Yeah. Was, uh, no, I just I just don't didn't understand. I mean, obviously, big French rider, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but I don't understand why he has become such a big rider in France in comparison to basically Arno Demar, who mm. has a far better Palmares, has won Grand Tour stages, he's won monuments, he's won just a lot more races. Um, he has seemingly kind of got the whole, you know, he was a farmer type thing. There's a backstory to it because I know that that seems to be important. So I don't understand why everyone in France seems to be team Pino and not team Damar mm. in this circumstance because I feel like this team represents that country. Mm. I don't know. I don't know actually. But I'm a yeah, I'm a I'm a Pino fan now. Yes. I just frustrating watch I hate watching these guys that are such good climbers and they can't descend for shit and and you see them gaining time and they got that plus twenty five seconds on Pidcock and you you just not, you're just waiting for them to crest the hill and that gap will just get just eaten come up. And you're just like, down. why are yeah. you bothering not to be Rude, but if you can't descend, how are you going to win a stage? And can't team again? It comes back to the, the the team. Can't they work on that? Like, get some descending coaches in. It's just frustrating as a viewer to watch this guy just eat people up on climbs and then lose it all the descents. <laughs> oh, painful. Any any things to sum up the tour in general? Like, I I have my only take on it was I actually think it's the best. I think they've finally nailed the parkour, the the length of stages. You know, I know they played around a few years ago with like the stupid like 70K stage and then, you know, the Giro is still doing it's like 300K transition stages. I just feel like every stage there was enough in it that could have always gone certain different ways. I feel like that was... Maybe it was because it was all in France. It was much easier for them to to do that. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I just felt like parkour-wise, entertainment-wise, even, even little things like thinking about where the break's going to go on a on a medium mountain stage. So trying to have that first climb like within the first 20 or 30 Ks mm. that something might sort of go there to make that entertaining. Yeah, I don't know. I just feel like that was that was the big win for me. Yeah, I don't have much else to add. The only thing I would say specifically was – for me, the winner win of the tour was the the Victor Campanarts drop back to pick up Pascal Ancorn. Wasn't it Pascal Ancorn? Yeah. Oh, yeah. To pick up Pascal, then bring them back, then start working as a group of four. And then he drills like the last kilometer and then they end up winning. I just that was just the most amazing, well thought out, incredible move. Get it close enough so then he can just bridge. I just thought that was just a work of art that 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 move and the hill that'll be that's legendary books you know Victor Campanites will be thinking back to that stage for the rest of his life that was Nailed it. that was incredible yeah did you cry with Mate Mohoric's interview or you just had no emotion no that I, I yeah I nearly, actually, that I, was I had a little I, yeah. yeah he's just a I don't know what else what what um what can I say? What adjectives can I add to that? It was uh, just the best, most down to earth, just amazing. Just I don't know what to say. I just yeah. loved. I just loved because that that is the mental mindset of me going to every race. Hmm. You just turn up and then you're like, "Oh shit! Everyone else is really good. <laughs> what the hell am I going to do?" And yeah. just to hear someone like him say that 
and the self doubt that he had. Um, I just, yeah. I also like, really like the part about how you get to the end of the race and then you really have to, you're having to just dog on everyone else to try and win the tactical game. And it's just so eat dog and dog and it's not for everyone. And it's actually quite horrible. And a part of racing that I never liked, uh, you, you, you know, we talk about people, oh, you wouldn't, that person wouldn't, you know, they, they wouldn't dope because it's unethical. I mean, racing, just tactics are, are unethical because mm. it's you trying to take advantage over someone else to get the win. So just ethics even in tactics is is a hard one and very rarely talked about and he managed to slip that in there as well. It was interesting. It is. Some people have it and some people don't. That real, yeah. And I call it like a killer instinct because I find myself, like I can become really attached to my breakaway sort of people and I'm like <laughs> almost cheering them on. Like we're, we're this, we are the team now, this breakaway. And to think that at some point in this race I'm going to dog them, yeah. like it's <laughs> it's a really horrible thought. No, yeah. I can kind of, yeah, a lot uh, of the time we'll think like, oh, maybe wouldn't it be good if you know, uh, Carlos got the win today or something? Like it just, yeah. It's, but it's, it's interesting that he obviously um, plays it over in his head. I can mm. tell you most of the other riders – well, they will <laughs> they'll stab you in the us. back of the yeah. neck in your sleep. They don't give a shit whether they roll you. Like that's the mentality of a pro cyclist. Like that's <laughs> they don't think about it. No, yeah, it's, it's interesting that someone does. Yeah. yeah, we're in the pre-event space barrel classic on the horizon. We're about 11, 11 weeks away. And I wanted to chat to you about what do you do when you're in when you're in sniffing of an event, the planning stage, because I'll do an eight weeks. Here's my thing. So I'm going to do an eight, uh, a two month build for, for barrels. So not quite two months out yet. Uh, so it hasn't started for me, but I'm in that planning stage and I love this. This is the, to me, this is the best part of the, 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 tra- the, the year. So when you're not actually doing the training, but you're in that planning stage where you're going through the, my life is going to change when this when this training block starts. It's just I'm just going to be amazing. So, do you do any of this? I have no idea what you're talking about. Really? I have no idea. I That's, no, I, I don't, don't do think this? like this at all. <laughs> I yeah, I, I'm in awe of the way that you can just separate or plan your your life and uh, events to this. To this goal, I just can't get around that. <laughs> I really can't. And maybe it's because I'm on the, I don't know, what is it? The, the no weeks off The no plan. weeks, the just sort of t- t- treading water plan or I, d- I don't know, but I just can't. So having you thought, okay, so are you going to ramp up training for barrel or are you just going to just stay fit for it? Are you going to do anything? Do you want me to be honest? Yeah. Yeah. Please right. be honest. Uh no, I want you to lie. Tell me to lie. And just... <laughs> All right. So I'll obviously try and do a good ride a barrel, but it's it's not something that um, – it's not a goal that I would set myself. No, okay, look. Loser. No. Just because I'm going to beat you. Yeah. that That's actually – that's <laughs> genuinely – no, that I'm glad you mentioned that because that is that is a legit thing. Oh, that's a you've thrown the white the this towels in. Tally. The towels in. Just reverse uh, reverse psychology. Yeah. Like we should, um, no. So there's there is that, but okay. Um, yeah, there are goals that I certainly do have. Barrels, mm. it's probably not one of them. Um, I'd like to have a good Masters Nationals. So that yeah, okay, maybe that is is something that is okay. is a kind of in the froth stage but mm. it's really interesting i don't do the so talk me through it like okay. what, how does this how does this play out in your well, head so because r- right now I'm, I'm pure maintenance training minimal just don't do nothing kind of thing waiting till i get within eight ish weeks or eight to ten barrel then i'll ramp it up but, but so i start doing this thing where you, you're playing the training okay what how many hours a week do i want to be doing um uh what times of the day am I going to be right at? Oh, I'm going to get up at 6 a.m. and No, I don't, I'm not actually going to do this. But you start going, I could fit in rides here on this day and, and on Fridays I might do a longer ride here. And um, what's my what, what supplements am I going to take? Because when I'm not training that much like I am now, I don't take any supplements. And I'm, okay, I'm probably going to bring in my iron supplementation back in a little bit earlier and planning things like that out. And I'm going to take creatine for this build. I might try it. When do I bring that in? Uh just all this stuff where you've Bam. just got this, 
idea, I basically build this mental image in my head of what my training, what that two months is going to look like training wise. And it's exciting. I love it. You just play, and you start going through, okay, what, what I'm about seven, I'm about probably 80 kilos right now. Okay. It'd be nice to be doing it at about 77. Okay. What am I, what sort of meals am I going to have? How, what's my approach going to be to, to, to drop the extra few kilos and just that whole process. I love it. I can't believe you don't, it, you just I think that's of... the difference between a, a proper athlete and a <laughs> pretend athlete, clearly. Um, no, that's it's really cool to hear. So can I ask uh, in terms of some of those specifics that you mentioned, are there things you're going to try here that you hadn't tried in the past? Is there – I mean, you're very – I know you're uh, – you you have a system that you know works in terms of your training. You're going to mm. try, try and do something different. You're going to – like being a coach, is this an opportunity for you to – I don't know – have a little um, mm. use yourself as a bit of a. No, I've done that so many times in the past yeah. that for this this specific build, I'm just going to repeat what works and just do that. You know, for those that watch my videos and watch that nationals prep video, basically do what I did when I came back from Europe last year, which is just hyper consistent, hardly any days off, and and just ride after ride after ride after ride, and not, nothing too special. Uh, maybe a bit of racing. Um, and then, yeah, I have, I have some volume targets that I, I want to hit. Um, but it's not even about like the actual training I mm. want to do. It's everything around that mm. where you just, you sort of build this idea around what, what you're going to do. And I do, yeah. I do get that. And it's looking forward to how fit you're going mm. to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. No, I do get that. The I do get that. So, but yeah. the hard part is not starting it too early. That's the problem I get into. Thankfully now I'm pretty busy, so I, I'm not. <laughs> and it's winter; it's cold, so it's it's okay. But you start to plan, and then you go, "Oh, that sounds that's good. I can't wait to do this." And then suddenly you're starting your build four months out because you're so excited. So it's actually the holding off for me. I really got to wait another month before mm. I start. Um, so it's actually for me. It's actually the holding off and just forcing the time off, and that I have to do. But ah, oh, just interesting that you don't really. You just maybe I'm yeah. downplaying it. Maybe maybe I am. It's, no, because uh, I didn't think you did. Yeah. That's why I, I put this in the notes because I thought oh, I'm spending a lot of time sort of thinking over this training. Yeah, no, I don't do that. Do. I'm like, yeah, I don't really feel like Chris does this. Though. So this is I can tell you why. It's because um, when we were organising the team, we were talking about this earlier on. Like you would see a race a, a certain couple of months away, and my first thing was always dread because of the amount of logistics that would go into then putting that race together. The, the, transport, the accommodation kind of thing. And, you know, having sort of – you you basically do that for me now. I don't do any of the booking accommodation because I'm so scarred from seven years of it. I'm like, I don't know, I'm just going to turn up, please. And so I think that's probably a little yeah. bit of it. I just can't mentally face that side of it. Mm. Um, yeah. But, no, all right. So – Barrel Classic, when is it? 31st of October or something? 21st, I think. 21st, 21st. of October. Yep. Get around it. Yes. 100%. It's going to be sick. You notice this over here? No. Oh, we got some new bits and bobs. Always. Every time we come in here, I'm thinking, what's. I've got to have a poke around the frames and see. Oh, okay. We've got different, different bars. Very similar bikes, aren't they? When you, if, when you sit down and look, yep. you start to go, there's no difference, so really. Seat post. Thickness of the seat post, so basically the chapter two just chops that off, mm -hmm. and in a sort of probably a weight saving maneuver, and the what what is the weight difference? Kind of, it's pretty much the same. The chapter two is lighter, so if I put those wheels mm -hmm. on, it's it's about hundred grams lighter than the Nero bike build. But to my eye. The chapter two actually looks faster. I agree because you've got the f better coverage over the front wheel, and the rear end looks pretty similar. Yep. A a seat post looks slightly more aero on the air. Oh, I'd say quite a bit more. But the front end looks it looks a bit sleeker, yes. a bit narrower on the air road, but better tucked in on the. I mean, it's this very so similar. So that down tube uh, is no. Is probably noticeably more shaped on the neuro bike mm -hmm. than it is on the chapter two. That would be like when you're sitting on top of it and you're looking down. That's that's quite a noticeable difference. But I reckon you're right. Like from behind, it's Jesus much of a muchness. It really is. Mm. What's the ride quality difference? 
Well, I'd like to get into that because, like, I, I honestly have come to the opinion that frames are, are now, for me, third third tier. Mm-hmm. I'm actually going tires, I'm going wheels, and then I'm going handlebars. Right. I think handlebars make a dramatic difference. To the ride quality. To the ride quality, yep. That's a big call. It's a big call because I think – what I found is the compliance in the handlebars. Like there's this thing like compliance and stiffness in the handlebars. It's You kind of think, oh, it's the same thing. Mm. Because if a handlebar's stiff, then surely it's going to lack compliance because stiff makes you feel like, oh, it must be like you're getting lots of road buzz through your hands. Whereas I think there is a real separation between it because stiff means when you're sprinting and you're putting something through the bars, it's not flexing, mm-hmm. Right. Whereas compliance to me is more about the road buzz feel. Mm. So for me, the Neurobike's compliance in those bars wasn't great. And it probably due to the design of not giving too much away, but they were movable mm. handlebars. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so they probably had to do something in the way it was built. Whereas and then I had the original Chapter 2 handlebars on the uh, – they're called the Manor bars. Mm. Super compliant, like really, really relaxed. You felt nothing almost. But the problem was I didn't feel they were that stiff. That's not why I changed them. I changed them because I couldn't get the dimensions that I wanted. And that's a whole other chat. Mm-hmm. Like I couldn't get a 38, 110. I could only get 40. 110, and that to me is too wide. So are you saying that they're both stiff and compliant or that they're both either ends of a spectrum and you've got to choose where you sit? For my riding so far, they lean more towards the stiff than the compliant aspect. And there's another aspect to this is because the shape of the um, the curve is really thin. You can put your hands on it, but it's like it almost like tapers in to like – almost trying to be like an aero shape to it. Mm-hmm. So you don't actually have a lot of handlebar to hang on to. Mm. So when you've just got like a thin thing in your hands like that, it just feels like it's going to shutter you around. The Envy bars, that's those aero Envy bars which are on the gravel bike, which are completely the most inappropriate gravel bike bars known to man, are completely the other end. So stiff that they're borderline unrideable, like especially off-road. It's horrendous. They are planks of carbon designed, obviously, to Mm. just be pure, pure stiff. Mm. And so you asked me about the ride feel of it. So I've had those two different bars on it and I've had two different wheel sets on it. And honestly, it's every time I change something like that, I just feel like, oh, this is different. This is completely different. This has changed my impression of how this bike rides. Mm. I think the problem is you've got differences in performance and then differences in how much you enjoy the ride. So Mm -hmm. you might say the more compliant bars are less stiff. Is that going to make a difference to the power output you're doing in your 800 watt sprint? Probably not, but it won't feel as agile. And this was Dave Arthur brought up in one of his recent videos saying, is are we going back to lightweight? That sort of thing. He was saying, no, aero is still really important. I don't really understand why people want light bikes. In my opinion, the light bikes are good. Even if they're not faster, they inspire confidence when you climb uphill they you they feel really amazing to ride out of the saddle that's why people like light stiff climbing bikes is for the sensation they give not necessarily because they're saving you time up a hill and same thing you got a slightly heavier eight kilo aero bike even up a hill if the time's similar it just doesn't feel as good so again maybe with the bars it's just interest, interesting that that's now a point um that you're then taking into the compliance into account. I thought you just want stiff as possible, especially uh, if you can make that up. You, you, I guess you're starting to now choose, okay, where am I making this bike compliant? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I would have said that and, until I'd ridden the Envy bars and discovered that, no, this is way too stiff for me. Like this, I don't I don't enjoy riding the bike with these bars Have on you there. ridden them on a road bike though? Have you had them in a road? No, and I'm sure they'd be great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure they'd be quite quite good on that. But, like, I'm running on the road. Like, I'm running those bars on the road, like on our footpath rides mm. with 40 PSI in the tyres and I don't like it. Like, it's too stiff and too jittery. 
So yeah. yeah, it's it was a clear and obvious sort of something's gone the the wrong mm. way for me. Um, but you, but that twitchiness feeling, you would might prefer on the road bike because you want that. Yeah, you you, you want it that you want that instant feeling of stiffness. Whether yeah. that makes you actually faster or not it doesn't really matter. Well, what what I would say about that actually getting you faster stuff is what position do, do the bars allow you to get into mm-hmm. and that's where I do think there are gains to be had in terms of actual speed and the, the thing with those envy ones is it's really nice to put your kind of palms mm. on the like on that hood section and get yeah. into like a super super aero-y nice position definitely mm. and it's where I would then lean towards all oh, right so the compliant ones become the faster ones for me because I I'm trying to cheat the wind as much as possible with my power output. And if I can get in as sort of aerodynamic position as possible, then there is a performance gain for me to have, definitely. So the, the, what do you mean compliant ones? What you're saying, weren't you saying the MV ones were stiff? Yeah, what, what I'm saying, flipping that around right. basically, is that if that sometimes I haven't ridden so those MV ones that say Heffron, that might be impossible for me to stay in a nice aero position Whereas the the fast sports ones, which I found to be nice and compliant, would potentially allow me to, or actually have allowed me to be in a pretty aerodynamic position for for a longer. Oh, I'm yeah. surprised that bars. I mean, I've yeah, I'm making that much of a difference. Yeah, that's yeah. Well, I think it's just more and more an important decision because with everything being integrated now, it's not like you can kind of do what I'm doing and just keep flipping around bars and stem until you kind of get something that really works for you. A lot of the time you're sort of forced into this decision like when you make the purchase. Mm. Um, and I do think it's a really important thing that if you are talking about bike reviews, like it really matters. So they don't taper the fast sports ones at all. Mm-hmm. So in fact, I would almost argue they kind of come in a little bit, mm. like mm-hmm. which is it's kind of nice, actually. Prefer, you sort yeah. of drop down and you're like, oh, hang on, I'm not putting my, my arms out wide. Yeah. no, I'm a But you're not really a drops guy. I'm not a drops guy. You're more of a hoods guy. I'm a hoods. I love a hoods. That's why you probably like the Envy one so much. So they just like, pull you. I don't know what they've done. It, it, it can't just be the taper because other brands do the taper. There's something about that transition that they've, whatever they've done to transition into the shift lever, the hood of that, it just... Yeah, I've, I've seen them on some ex-teammates bikes and it's yeah, they do manage to do that. I feel like it was designed with the Shimano DI2 like hood in mind. I don't know what it looks like with a with a SRAM one. Mm. But yeah, like you you don't need to have your hands sitting perfectly in the hoods of the of the levers. Mm. They can kind of just not find any sort of spot around there and they sort of happily sit in there. And then there's the other thing about how the how the frame, how the bar and stem integrates with the frame because that's not always exactly the way the frame designer may have designed. Like so, that that bike was designed to have the Mana frame, the Mana bars on there. Mm-hmm. And so I contacted Fast Sports and asked them about like, can we put this on there? And like, yeah, we're pretty confident, but it's like we're pretty confident. You're not 100 percent confident. And when Edwin at Cache built that, he did a pretty good job, like coming up. So that's the that's the fast sports top cap on there, not the chapter two one. Yep. And we were kind of flipped around because the chapter two one works better with the frame, but the fast sports one works better with the bars. And that was kind of a mm. good place. It looks to a be. bit, um, you can see the divot behind. It looks Correct. like it wants to be filled in. Yep. So that's the chapter nice. two one would have filled yeah. that in. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I know, like having spoken to, to Michael Pride at chapter two, like why they don't just offer some endless variety of of bars and stems is because they're all individual molds and just like like ordering kit mm. like you're not going to make many 3810s cuz most people aren't going to do that mm. so mm-hmm. yeah yeah and then they're sitting in stock in a factory somewhere and you never end up selling them correct yeah what do you think of the wrap, by the way? So Bunny Hops wrapped me up Minimal. Again. They've done a minimal, gone a bit minimal. I really like the uh, Nero Show logo on the cranks. Very nice. Yeah, so he, he, he might try and get that up on his website as well so you can um, 
be able to to do a, a crank solution. And on the front, that's very pro. The Nero on the handlebars, like all the pro, they put the Vision or the FSA stickers on the front. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, yes. no, he's, he's done a. Uh, that was a really broad brief. I just sort of said, look, let's just, let's get a bit of the wrap. On what there. about wheels? Can you do a wheel 100%. wrap? Oh, because yeah. Because that you could do some interesting designs in terms of making it look cool when it's spun up. Yep. At speed and doing something like that, that could be interesting. Yes, definitely. I'm. I'm. You, you can. That's what actually most people do. That they like. They like. Actually, most people. Put the decal of the brand, but change the color of it. So it might be like DT Swiss or Reserve, and have that that color decal of whatever their bike is. So they might have a red bike mm-hmm. with DT Swiss wheels, and they put a red DT Swiss logo over the top of it. In classic Neuro Show fashion, I've I've got something I wanted to talk about here. But I haven't really done a lot of research on it. It's just I saw on LinkedIn of all places uh, one of these research. Um, companies put out a, a, a cycle tourism market projections for the next 10 years in the US. At the moment, I think it's around a $25 billion industry and it's going to go up 8.3% per annum for the next decade up until 2030. Huge, huge growth. And I, it was interesting because I've seen it firsthand personally, but then to see these numbers projections about how big this is, especially post-COVID, um, was 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 really interesting. I thought get your thoughts on it because I've I, I mean I've seen it firsthand because I've I get people um, that are looking for coaching mm. and they don't race, they don't they they don't really do club rides, but every year they go to Girona and they do a two week trip and they just want to either want to beat their mates and be the fittest guy there or just not suffer for two weeks. So I, I'm seeing a lot of. In terms of if we look about the, the the size of the industry, I'm benefiting from it because people are, like take this seriously. Anecdotally, yeah, this thing, this thing is definitely taking. I don't think there's anyone left in <laughs> Sydney at this point. They're all meandering somewhere around Europe. Um, yeah, it's funny what you said there about wanting to beat their mates because that's a really common. Like I actually ran into someone the other week in the park, and they were sort of saying something similar, they're going to go to the Pyrenees, they're going to go with a bunch of guys, oh, we don't race, we don't race, any of that kind of stuff, et cetera. Mm. It's like, oh, but I'm going, to get some, I'm going to get some lightweight carbon wheels for it and sort of you delve a little bit deeper and all of a sudden mm. uh, the ego is certainly going to play a role <laughs> during it, definitely. Um, I'm not surprised to see this sort of growing. The other kind of interesting, there's not necessarily relevant to you as a coach, but the e-bike stuff here because – that's I know something that I think it's Top Sport here in in Sydney do when they they now offer e bikes for people going to do the Pyrenees and that sort of stuff because now instead of having to employ Jesse Coyle as a coach for a couple of weeks it's like oh good we'll just um do some e biking e bikes yeah I think a huge cut of this industry would would be e bikes so they got here um, they've broken it down so the majority is groups or or, or friends. And then the next biggest one is just people solo. Mm. And then the smaller groups is, is family or couples, which is a smaller piece. But by far the majority is, is groups. And it's – where have you seen people going? I mean, I've just seen well, Girona. This... It's, it's just everyone goes to Girona. So my question – okay, no, where would you go? If you oh. want to go cycle touring. Oh. Oh. So my thing would be I wouldn't go to one of the main sort of routes because I kind of feel like I could probably do that and there's enough sort of uh, there's enough information out there. I'd love to do Japan, mm-hmm. Japan somewhere like that. Maybe even Vietnam. That sort of part of the world for me would be the the perfect cycle tourism location. Mm. I feel like Girona would be more of a training camp mm. style place. Would be would be good to to, to do that. Ah, uh, Europe, Switzerland area. I just that that it's just Switzerland is. And any of those, any of the other adjoining countries around that belt of that Alpine region is just amazing. Just, just yeah, to, to, to do a just loops and loops and make my way through there would be amazing. When I was living in, in Ireland, we, Deeks and I went down to Bo- the, the base of Alpuez. It was an a English couple running like a guest housey type thing, which was pretty much set up like this. It was for cyclists. They turn, you turned up, they did your meals. They even took you out in their van to drop you down the hill to start your rides and all that kind of stuff, king of the mountain. I don't think they still exist. But, yeah, at that 
point it was kind of just starting out. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I I wouldn't probably go back there. No. I think I think yeah, Japan. Give me mm-hmm. a crack over there. Mm. All right, Jesse. Question without notice. I'm gonna I'm going to airdrop you a link. Okay. Here. Okay. And Ooh. you are going to open it up. So what we're Let's doing go. here is I'm trying. I'm going to try and just inside hit you the with, mind. I'm going to try and hit you with a kit brand <laughs> oh, every week, and we're just going to like, uh, what's the, what's the like? Just head the top line. All right. Have a discussion about it. Okay. All right. Okay. So have a quick look around the website. Any thoughts, suggestions? Okay. We Who's are. This for? We're what's on. It doing? We're on b- Bubbuck dot co. Bubba kit. Yep, I'll run with that. Okay, we are going. We are going first. I can. This is way too fashionable a looking website for me. We can. T- we've got the text. We've got the posed photos. This, no one's riding their bike in any of the photos. No, no one. Like. No one has a helmet, and this this woman actually doesn't even have cycling shoes on. Let's go prices. We are. I'm telling you now. This is Paz normal spec. Mm-hmm. I can sell you now. Okay, we got jersey, 178 euros for the jerseys. Looks like a cycling jersey to me. What more can I say? Bib shorts, bib shorts, bib shorts. Paz normal. It's paz normal. It's that color. What I don't I still don't know what you call that. It's that. You should call it's colors. It's just that color. Essentials. It's that. Yep. It's that. So you got brown, navy, black. Cargo, you've got some attacker spec pu- bright purple ones, 178 euros. Okay. So to me, this hits a lot like a, a New Balance, um, New Balance like apparel thing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That's the sort of fluoro y, like 80s decals with those sort of muted colors. I think they have a range here called the, what is it? The. Uh, the spirit of tomorrow wow. or something like that. But like, so it's 600 Australian for a kit. That's up. That is up there. That is really up there. It's, um, it's amazing. That there's a 600 euro kit, $600 kit mm-hmm. for a brand that I've never heard of. And I know people are going to jump. Oh my God, these guys have been around for decades. They're doing amazing things. But obviously there's, these guys have had a bit of success in the past, but it it just goes to show that there is it's a whole world of kit out there that clearly we have completely passed us by. Well, the, the funny thing, because initially I thought, you know, these brands would, would start up and they probably have a bit of capital and let's just charge, you know, 400, 350, 400 euro for a kit and see if it works. But they've been around for uh, quite a long time. I, I'm, back at the start of their Instagram and their first post was in 2015. So it, it, they've been around. I just not, wish they, they haven't disappeared. They must be making – people must be buying it. So I really like this kit. I think it looks sick. I'm a big fan of it. That's why I am talking about it because it popped up on my Instagram and I really like the look of it. Mm-hmm. Well, just, I just don't understand why it needs to be this expensive. Like is is it – does it have to be this expensive because it's small to justify its place? Well, this is someone's this is someone's business. But here's the thing: it's it's only cool because it's expensive. So it just feeds itself. People want to wear. People would want to be wearing this because it's because it's expensive and edgy and cool. Right? But it's not exp- It's 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 not edgy and cool if it's cheap. So the price justifies. The branding of it and the branding of it makes people want to buy it. And yeah, it. The thing is, it's unapolog. What I like about this is this is unapologetically fashion. Yes, I agree. It's not trying to. They're not spinning some story or doing anything. It's just this is cool looking kit. If you want to look cool, pay you six hundred dollars and off you go. Yep. And I, I rate that. I, I think it's refreshing. I probably it's not something I would buy. Because it's, but it's clearly not targeted at me. But I, I, I appreciate the the just it's fashion. Yep, I if agree. You, um, but I, this stuff needs to exist because yes. I go out to La Perouse on a Saturday morning and you see these the, these groups of three and four, and they look cool. Mm-hmm. Like that's what a twenty two year old, been a few years in a corporate job and wants to do a cool hobby on the weekend wants to look cool so this stuff needs to exist and because people want to 
Yeah, it, it, it fits um, stick in the box for someone, and I rate that. I'm very surprised with your with your take, and I'm I'm impressed, Jesse. I'm very impressed. I, I totally agree with you. I'm I'm stoked this stuff exists. Um, it's yeah. I mean, I love the look of it. That uh, grey, the TSOT team jersey olive with the blue, mm-hmm. the, the navy nicks. Yeah, totally get around that. In fact, you could even force me into a gilet here because that gilet, the purple gilet, looks pretty cool. Hmm. But the thing is, I don't know why I. I kind of I'm annoyed that you're surprised that I'm for because I don't want to. Mm. I'll have a go at a brand or, or, or for something if they've contradicted on themselves or something or there's something I genuinely disagree with. Uh, this seems like a genuine fashion business to me. I don't know why. I'm a bit frustrated that you thought I that I might. You. Yeah, oh, I'm yeah. Like, oh, you're is that what you think yeah. of me that I'm just hating on stuff for no yeah. reason? Only buys from uh, AliExpress. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I don't, no. It's does it's doing a job. I don't know. I, it's. I'm I'm offended that you thought I would have a go at this brand. No, I'm 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 impressed. Speaking just really quickly of kit, do you want to give a quick update on on stocks if there are any left of the Nero suit where we are? Oh, with geez, that? that sounds bad. Now we're going to promote our own. Yeah, we're going to promote. Get into oh, it. That's Come disgusting. on, do the hard sell, Jesse. <laughs> this is how you make. If you the don't dollars. want to spend six hundred dollars on a kit, <laughs> no, uh, it was um. So the smalls are sold out. Uh, one medium left, and then there's. Of five large and five extra large left. So yeah, if you uh, large or extra large in particular, there's a few left. So go on and, and grab those if you want. I was there was a I was quite surprised at this is going to sound really navel gazy, but I just wanted to to share that the, the stories of people. Some of the people were buying the kit, and this is kind of mind blowing to me. One of the person messaged me. He bought the kit because he was going over to Europe soon, and so it was a domestic shipped kit. But he wasn't buying it for him. He was buying it for a friend as a gift. Mm. So, and I thought that was, that was uh, really set me back that someone s- likes the show so much and likes the, to, wants to support us and likes the kit so much that he thinks it's cool enough to give as a gift to a friend. Oh, wow. Yeah. That is cool. Yeah. I can understand people wanting to buy it for themselves because mm. they want to, you know, they do that. Mm. But to, to have that t- as a, something someone would think of as a gift. I was yeah, that was like wow, that's yeah, that's, that's kind of cool. cool. Not that I spend hours just <laughs> yeah reminiscing on their own show, but mm. I don't know, that was quite yeah quite cool to hear. No, I think we've been both been blown away by it. It's been been super um, impressive actually. Us standing up here and saying it's a fantastic performing skin suit means nothing because we're selling it. So if you have bought it and I know you're gonna like it, I w- it would be cool if people got in the comments and left their just. For, for the people that are maybe on the fence, if, if you guys get it and ride in it, let us know what you think, good or bad. I, I'm, it's going to be good feedback because I know it's a good skin suit, but it'd be mm. cool f- to, for if people are comfortable sharing that in their comments, their experience with it, it would be cool. Yeah, cool and ta- tag us in pictures of us. Um, I will be making an effort to update the Instagram page to ensure that there is a Neuro Show Instagram page coming soon. Watch mm-hmm. this space. But for now, just just tag Jesse or I in it. Yeah. Coaching chat, mm. just because you got to hear me just – Speak about coaching stuff now. A <laughs> um, couple of funny funny things have, have come up. This idea of people were wanting to know if if you're a good fit. Now, I could understand a, a rider perhaps wanting to know if, if the coach is a good fit for them. So before getting started, they might want to have a call and, and discuss that. Uh, personally, I don't do that. I don't have, I don't have time to have a call with every person that's remotely interested in coaching just to chew the fat. I'd, it would be, it would, I don't have time. So I don't do these sort of just have a chat calls because mm. it's not good business. So generally if people get in touch with me for coaching, you're coming straight in. You're either in or you're out. I don't have time to, to, to do those introductory calls. But the funny thing was some coaches will do them. But generally if you're starting out you, you and you're trying to get business, you'll probably – open to do that, which is fine. But the weird one was I've seen some coaching businesses use it as this sort of bait, bait sort of a bait thing of book in a call. Like if you want to get coached, book in a call and we'll let you know if you're suitable to be coached. Oh. It's that they flipped it, which I thought right. was interesting. Because in, in what other <laughs> profession would you do that? Imagine going to see a physio. You book in to see a physio and they say, oh, actually, before we start this appointment, Let's just have a brief chat and see if we vibe. And if not, you can just go home. It's like, it's so unprofessional. I thought it was interesting that coaching businesses do that. 
So it is it a way to for the coaching business to come across as being more premium or like boutique than they <laughs> really are? I think so. Yeah. I think so. It's sort of we've only got limited availability. So if you did want to get coached, book a call. And if you're just good enough, we might be able to take mm. you on. So it's that, it's that whole, I hate sales. And it's that annoying flipped sales thing of you don't sell to the client, get the client to sell to you. So tell them that we might not be able to take you and they'll therefore think that it's more valuable. I just, it's a funny, but like in what other industry does that work? Like, you, Yeah. And you, so then, <laughs> then in that, that sort of bunch or that mates group, like, so he comes back and says, oh, yeah, I'm in. I got in. I got in. <laughs> yeah. got in. How good. I, rec- I, th- I, I would – I actually think it's probably more common than we realise <laughs> if you think about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like so you would never – you don't do the other way around. You don't do too much of the call someone to find out whether they're the right sort of – or can you pick that up pretty quickly? No. So I I, I just say well, I've got an entire YouTube channel with hours of me talking about training. If you get but most of the people who are getting in touch with me for coaching already kind of know I am and know my vibe and okay. well know if we're going to click. So that doesn't – I don't feel like that requires any further thing. Yep. And then, I mean, my job as a coach is to be professional and work with a wide variety of athletes. I can't imagine this situation where someone knows me and wants to be coached and I then say no. I mean – so does the, very rare. does the prospective athlete, when they're doing this, this pre-call, mm. are they sort of sharing like the their training data with like... I actually don't know. Don't know? Because <laughs> I don't yeah, do I them. I find this interesting. Like are they then, is the chat going to be, oh, okay, right, well, I can see that you were, you were with Jesse Coyle before, but, you know, the, your 20-minute power has not really gone up as much as it should have. We'll... we'll 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 sort that for you <laughs> yeah. type thing. Like I wonder, yeah. I don't know what goes on in these calls. Okay. Um, I guess but I'm of the opinion that I need to be able to work with anyone. Mm. It's a job. It's just like a physiotherapist. Can't just, okay, there might be specialists in certain areas of the body and things like that, but it's a general coaching. You need to be able to work with anyone. Uh, so I, I, I find it, I can't imagine, I, I, I know if someone's going to be right for coaching based off, they just let me know what, what are you looking to get out. I could mm. you'd be able to tell, uh, and even if you if you if 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 it's if that's not right, they can just leave anyway. I don't. It just seems so strange. But you nailed it in the first place. Out. You nailed it in the first place. It's a sales technique. I it's got to it be is. a sales technique. It's yeah. it's like the it's like the thing we were talking about a few weeks ago with um, bike bike uh, bike shops doing the whole. Um, oh look, we'll see. We, We'll see if you can we can get you on a giant TCR. You know, we'll, we'll I've got see, a call with I'll, I'll, HQ. I'll have, a, I'll have a call with Taiwan and see if we can fit you on one. We're like, oh, it'll be recommended retail price, yeah. but you know, they only want you know. Oh, you want the blue one? Oh, well, we're really going to have to work some magic to make that happen for you. And then it kind mm. of it's almost as though it's like this reverse cachet thing that, mm. that gets built up. Yeah. Other one as well that that, that happened happens as well is coaches that charge a startup fee. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know about this, but generally coaches will charge per month and then quite a few charge a startup fee, which could be anywhere from um, introductory fee of $60 up to two or $300. Mm. So before you start, you got to pay your first month and then this startup fee. Mm. And I can't, what are you paying for? <laughs> Startup fee. Yeah. Right. Okay. Could so you? Like a, would you pay? Like a, this is like an installation fee. Yeah. So, so it's, you get it's switched it's a, on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. You got to get the lights turned on. Okay. It's, um, All right. Fair so, enough. what about deposits? Is that a thing that does anyone do that? Well, then you get on to the other thing I was going to say, which is so you got your your startup fee, and then you got your minimum mm. p- commitment. Uh, so three month minimum, or six month minimum. And pretty common, I did a, a brief look over some other coaching businesses, uh, quite a few other coaching businesses. It's almost 50-50 whether they have a three-month minimum commitment. So on this, let's just stay on this. I got, that's I got classic, thoughts on both. That's right? a classic gym. Yeah. Classic gym. Classic gym. I got thoughts on both, right? So the startup fee. I think there's a 
What are you, I mean, what are you paying? What sort of analysis are you expecting before you get coached? Because this idea that you come on with a coach and they're going to give you this amazing analysis of the writing you've been doing for the last few years to get all these insights off the bat. I, I'm, I think that's what the startup fee is meant to pay for. But you, I can say, if you wanted to do a proper analysis of someone's tr- past training, if you haven't been coached them with no context, it is it would be an entire day's work to sit there and, and properly look through it. Because think about it, you don't know any of the sessions. All you're seeing is calendar full of files. You'd have to pretty much go through every run, label them with what the session was. It, it is a huge amount of work. I mean, I can look at someone's training and give a loose, very general, here's some of the mistakes you've been making. I think we could improve here. But really, you're paying for coaching. You're paying from what happens from here on onwards. The startup fee is... What, yeah. Is it just a ca- is it just a bit of a a bit of a little cash grabs at the start in case they leave early? <laughs> the three month minimum doesn't surprise me. Yeah, that that sounds like that's pretty routine. I would have thought about any any coaching thing ac- across a lot of different a uh, lot of different sports. I know even back skiing that was that was a thing that you did a you did a six week minimum at that time. Yep. But the, the startup fee is an interesting startup one. Startup one fee, okay. Even on, so on the minimum, can you, maybe you can try and sell me on why there should be a three-month minimum. I don't understand the situation. So I can say if most people don't leave within the first three months anyway, so it's not really that necessary. And even if they do, it's usually for genuine reasons. Like I got a promotion at work, I've got no time now, and there's no point being coached. Seems weird to hold them and charge them for an extra two months when they literally just can't do the training. Or I just thought coaching was going to be this and I, I don't, this is not for me. Would you actually, would coaches really hold someone to their minimum Probably commitment? Not. No. It no. seems weird. If someone wants to leave, let them leave. What a- but coming back to the gym thing, it's it's where you then get to play with the packages and you can do the whole, you know, Black Friday special, insta- we're going to waive the installation fee or the, mm. the startup fee or we're going to give you – the other one they love doing is uh, we'll give you the first first month free. First month free of your – but you've still got to pay basically two months worth because then you've got your initial sort of start. It kind of gives you room to move with sort of different sales and promotions. Mm. Yeah. Because wouldn't you want to do the opposite? If I, I was thinking if I was really trying to get more riders, if I was starting out – I'd make make the first month free. Mm. Like, aren't you trying to get people in the door and show them what it's like? And <laughs> you would think they would think it's valuable and keep it going. It seems weird to charge them more to get started. But that, that goes uh, against. Or, or do people just do? Do coaches just start up and and that's just the done thing? So they just do it. Uh, it's really. I thought maybe it's uh, is this really that well thought out? But it's it's a bit like the pre call thing that you were talking about. It's it's just another way of building the exclusivity of it. We need you, we need you to lock the first three months in, Jesse, because there's a there's a friggin' like <laughs> queue of people back here. And if you don't like if you don't want to lock yourself in, we'll just take one of these guys, you know? <laughs> so Yeah. Mm. Or it's or we charge a startup fee. We just we just need to do the analysis. We're just gonna sit down and we're gonna um, you're not what sort of analysis are you doing for fifty dollars anyway? I don't get oh yeah, it's funny. <laughs> I just wanted to have a little – get that one off my chest. Anyway, we just, we just want to announce that Nero Coaching will be launching a $100 startup offer. fee. <laughs> <laughs> the first – And a 12-month 12 12 commitment. commitment. If you're not serious, we don't, yeah. we don't want you. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, anyway, let us know your thoughts down below, guys. Um, coaching protocols, starting out coaching, what have you experienced? What do you think is kosher? All right, so this is the last time we're going to be talking to each other in person for about a month. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be in the U.S. as I filled you guys in last week. Uh, we are fully intending to keep the show going. Whether or not we're going to still we're going to be able to maintain the exact upload day, I'm not going to guarantee that. Just with everything else going on mm-hmm. while we're away, but we certainly do intend to do that. Hopefully, um, we'll get a few guests on board. Obviously, Tyler will come on at some point. And yeah, apart from that, it should be pretty much business as usual. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, any, you're going to be busy, Chris. Got to get that Red Bull sponsorship. Got to get oh, the Red Bull be, yeah, at the right. HQ. Yeah, got to find out what's going on with Jeff at NorCal. We'll get down to that as well. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and yeah, I am going to do some racing. Thank you so much. Oh, actually, I will follow this up definitely. But when I put oh. that shout out last week about some racing in the US, I expected a few people to say, oh, there's some race here, there's some race there. There's like a dozen races <laughs> in the month that I'm there in just this one part of California. People in America, you don't realize that's an entire race calendar here in Australia. <laughs> So I'm I'm stoked with that. I'm definitely going to try and do the university road course, and there is one the week after I arrive. I'm not committing to that one yet, but it's the Patterson Pass one. Are you going to do our visa? Have you oh, got that's that? Happen, when are you yeah, going 100%. through? Oh, we're doing that daily. Okay, it's going to live. In are, you, our visa. are you staying near there? No. For any? Okay. No, but there's one of the <laughs> one of the race days that I would do is going to be close close to him. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to get up and, and definitely try and do that. Mm. Yeah. So question is, what wheels do I take? It'll be really weird seeing a video of you, like when you upload a video and you're on the course, because I've watched so many NorCal, him commentating it, be, what's Chris Miller doing? What? Yeah, off the what? back. Yeah, <laughs> it'd be so off the funny. Back. So should I run the full deep dishes? What bike are you taking? I'm taking the Chapter 2. Should I run the full deep dishes? Or So basically all the riding that I'll do is, it's pretty hilly. It's yeah. really hilly where I am. Mm-hmm. But all the those races a relatively flat except for the Patterson Pass one if I do that, which is like a 20-minute climb. Mm-hmm. So do I just man up, muscle up? And well, you don't have any many other – you don't have many shallower options. What would you take if you didn't take the reserves? I could find some – I could get some 30s. Oh, no, I think you're taking the just reserves. Just take the deeps? Yeah. Okay. The big dogs. The big dogs. Aero is everything. Aero is everything. Hashtag. All right. we'll, just, we'll just go for that. But, um, yep. yeah, that's just a long – outro to, to today's Sick. video and yeah so we'll um we'll be doing our best over that period of time you what bike bag do you use uh that's Sycon aero so comfort. you can leave the handlebars yeah, on and take that on. okay nice that's interesting get in yeah my rationale for telling everyone that is to please subscribe to the channel <laughs> Because <laughs> because we don't exactly know when we're going to upload. So, so you need to subscribe. You need to subscribe. Or you, how would you ever how, find the video you'll if never you find didn't it. subscribe? You'll, it'll just be Chris, lost. Because it's a lost court. No one subscribes. It doesn't matter. We, we <laughs> the frigging algorithm's too good. It's too good. And at this point, everyone's given up. But most people just unsubscribe. And get yeah. unsubscribe <laughs> from the channel. There you go. Someone asked, Someone left that as a comment last on the the, the, the doping chat we had. Being like, what are you going to do when people – are you worried that people are going to unsubscribe? It's like no one subscribes anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Since the show started, you, you've gained like 2,000 <laughs> subs. <laughs> and this show cumulatively is on about one and a half million views total yep. Yep. and about – 2,000 subs. Yep. It's, just it's just pointless. No one's willing to commit. Yeah. It's fair enough. Fair enough. What are we going to do when we get 2 million views for the sh- for the Nero show? I'm going to have a party? <laughs> celebration? We might hit it for the 50th episode, actually. That'd episode, be cool if we timed it. 2 million? Will you, you pay attention to the to that? Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Mm-hmm. We got to, I don't know. We'll have to think of something. Got to, got to wrap. Go for a bike wrap. Go for a bike ride. 50k bike ride <laughs> gosh all right that's us done um jesse i will see you in a month or so yep virtually and uh yeah guys thank you so much for watching make sure to unsubscribe from this channel <laughs> like this video and we'll speak to you real soon bye